Remember that lymphocytes are a key component of adaptive immunity. While all leukocytes originally come from stem cells in the bone marrow, the B lymphocytes, also called B cells, mature in the bone marrow, whereas T lymphocytes, or T cells, mature in the thymus. Together, the bone marrow and thymus are the primary lymphoid organs. The secondary lymphoid organs include the lymph nodes, spleen, Peyer's patches in the small intestine, the appendix, and tonsils. The secondary lymphoid organs are where lymphocytes come into contact with pathogens that are activated. You can think of these secondary lymphoid organs as being like the guard houses and watchtowers along the castle wall. Guards take intruders to the guardhouse, where they are interrogated, and the army is called out if necessary. Like the guard stations of the castle, many of these secondary lymphoid organs are also strategically located at sites where invasions are likely. For example, the tonsils guard the nose and mouth from invaders, whereas fire's patches and the appendix guard against invasion from the digestive tract. Secondary lymphoid organs also house macrophages, and other immune system cells. The lymph nodes are small, oval, or bean-shaped secondary lymphoid organs embedded in connective tissue and arrayed along lymphatic vessels. Clusters of lymph nodes are found where several lymphatic vessels converge, for example in the cervical, axillary, and inguinal regions. The functions of the lymph nodes are to filter the lymph by removing antigens and other debris that may have entered the lymph and to enable B and T cells to interact with antigens. These interactions generate immune responses. Here's a close-up of a lymph node. Lymph nodes are covered by a dense connective tissue capsule. Lymph nodes are separated into sections by bundles of collagen fibers called trabeculae that extend from the capsule deep into the node. Beneath the capsule is the subcapsular sinus. This is the first of a series of sinuses, interconnected dilated channels through which the lymph flows as it passes through the lymph node. Lymph from the afferent lymphatic vessels empties into the subcapsular sinus and then flows into sinuses in the outer cortex. The outer cortex of the lymph node is the area just below the subcapsular sinus. Here, B cells are found, organized into oval-shaped collections of cells called lymphoid follicles. Some of the follicles contain lighter staining central areas called germinal centers. These are formed by B cells proliferating in response to antigen. Moving inward from the outer cortex, we come to the deep cortex. Lymphocytes exit blood vessels and enter lymph nodes in the deep cortex. T cells congregate in the deep cortex, which is rich with dendritic cells that have captured antigens and are presenting them on their surfaces. T cells wander through the deep cortex searching dendritic cells for that T cell's special antigen. The central area of the node is the medulla. It is shaped into elongated masses of cells called medullary cords around which lymph flows. Medullary cords contain both types of lymphocytes as well as macrophages and plasma cells which are derived from B cells and are antibody producing factories. Efferent lymphatic vessels leave and blood vessels enter and leave the node at a shallow indentation called the hilum. Let's observe the flow of lymph through the lymph node. Now let's look at the spleen. The largest of the lymphoid organs, the spleen is a fist-sized, blood-rich organ located to the left of and dorsal to the stomach. The spleen performs the same cleansing function for the blood as the lymph nodes do for the lymph. The spleen removes pathogens and aged erythrocytes and platelets from the blood, stores platelets and breakdown products of red blood cells, and provides a site for the interaction of lymphocytes with antigens. 
As you explore the structure of the spleen, notice how this structure allows intimate contact between blood and lymphocytes, just as the structure of lymph nodes is designed for intimate contact between lymph and lymphocytes. The mucosal surfaces of the digestive tract, as well as the respiratory tract and genitourinary systems, are vulnerable to invasion by pathogens because they are directly exposed to the external environment. Like guardhouses and watchtowers strung along a castle wall, we have collections of lymphoid tissue called the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues, MALT, strategically distributed throughout the mucosae. MALT includes the tonsils, appendix, and Peyer's patches of the small intestine, as well as more diffuse collections of cells in the respiratory tracts and other mucosae. These tissues are unencapsulated or partially encapsulated collections of lymphocytes. MALT contains both B and T cells, with the B cells occurring in lymphoid follicles similar to those found in lymph nodes and the spleen. Peyer's patches are found in the mucosa of the distal portion of the small intestine. In this photomicrograph, you can see the many lymphoid follicles in the small intestine that make up the Peyer's patches. Like the tonsils and other malt components, Peyer's patches are located where they can sample the antigens moving through hollow organs open to the external environment. If a pathogen escapes the defenses of the malt, it can still be cleared by responses of the lymph nodes or spleen. We have now finished our investigation of malt, the last of the secondary lymphoid tissues and organs that we will consider. Now let's look at the thymus, a primary lymphoid organ. The thymus is the site for differentiation of lymphocytes into mature T cells. Thymic hormones and other factors influence the development of immature T cells. The thymus is a bilobed organ located in the mediastinum. In young children, the thymus is large relative to body size. The relative size of the thymus, as well as its function, gradually decreases with age. In the elderly, Thymic epithelial cells are almost entirely replaced by fat cells and fibrous connective tissue. This process, called thymic atrophy, may be one reason why the elderly are more susceptible to infection. Let's observe thymic atrophy. Now we'll view the organ more closely. Each lobe of the thymus is divided into many lobules. Each lobule contains an outer cortex and an inner medulla. Most of the cells in the thymus are immature T cells at various stages of development. Scattered amongst the T cells are thymic epithelial cells which influence T cell development and secrete thymic hormones such as thymopoietin and the thymosins. Within the medulla are distinctively shaped structures called thymic corpuscles. Thymic corpuscles are clusters of keratinized epithelial cells with a world appearance that are scattered throughout the medullary area. While their function is not completely understood, they are thought to be involved in the development of a type of T-cell called a regulatory T-cell. The second line of defense comes into play when a pathogen has penetrated the surface barriers and entered the body. Second line defenses attempt to limit the spread of pathogens through the body by taking a multifaceted approach to pathogen elimination. Although these innate internal defenses are fast acting, they are nonspecific and provide only a kind of crude protection against any and all pathogens that enter the body. Think of them as being like the guards inside the castle. There are five lines of innate internal defense. One line of innate internal defense consists of the phagocytic cells, primarily the neutrophils and macrophages. A second set of cells, the natural killer or NK cells, kill body cells that have turned traitor by becoming either virus infected or cancerous. 
Another line of defense does not involve cells at all, but rather antimicrobial proteins such as complement and interferons. The last two lines of defense are neither cells nor proteins, but processes. They are inflammation and fever. Sometimes the innate defenses are no match for invading pathogens, just as a massive invasion can overwhelm the guards on a castle wall. In this case, the armies of the adaptive defenses must be called out. Having already met the enemy, the innate defenses can influence the kind of response the adaptive immune system makes by passing chemical messages to the adaptive immune system, rather like this guard gesturing to his friends. This process is one of the many ways in which the innate and adaptive defenses work together. Pathogens that enter the body are often rapidly ingested by phagocytes. This process begins when a phagocyte recognizes and binds a pathogen. You might wonder how the phagocyte knows that something is a pathogen and not part of the body. Phagocytes use special cell membrane receptors, such as the mannose receptor and the toll-like receptors, or TLRs, to recognize and bind molecules that are found only on certain pathogens, particularly bacteria, and not on normal body cells. At least 10 different toll-like receptors have been identified on human phagocytes, each binding to a different pathogen molecule. When phagocytes recognize a pathogen, two events are triggered. The first is the ingestion of the pathogen. The second is the release of chemical alarm signals that mobilize other cells of innate and adaptive immunity. Let's observe a phagocyte bind pathogens. Pathogens and the immune system are involved in an evolutionary arms race. Many pathogens have evolved strategies to avoid being killed by phagocytes. Let's watch the macrophage try to destroy each type of bacterium, encapsulated and unencapsulated. Now, let's try the other kind. One strategy certain bacteria have evolved is to enclose themselves in a capsule that makes it more difficult for phagocytes to grab them. In response, the immune system has evolved molecules that can coat these bacteria and provide handholds that allow the phagocytes to bind and engulf these bacteria. This process of coating bacteria to enhance phagocytosis is called opsonization. Two immune molecules that can act as opsonins are antibodies and complement. We will learn more about both of these later, but here we will focus on antibodies. Observe a bacterium as it is coated with antibody. Phagocytes have receptors that attach to the opsonins. The opsonins form a link binding together the pathogen and the phagocyte, triggering phagocytosis. There are several other strategies that pathogens have evolved to escape destruction by phagocytes. These include secreting molecules that block the fusion of lysosomes with the phagosome, developing resistance to the effects of lysosomal enzymes and reactive oxygen intermediates, and finding ways to escape the phagosome take up residence, and replicate within the cytoplasm of the phagocyte. The bacterium that causes tuberculosis is known for its ability to hide out and replicate inside macrophages. In response to bacterial strategies such as those already mentioned, the immune system has evolved a counter-strategy. Certain T cells of the more sophisticated adaptive defense mechanisms can enhance the entire killing process within the macrophage. This enhancement only happens when the macrophage presents antigen from such bacteria to the T-cell. The interaction between T-cells and phagocytes is another example of the interaction between innate and adaptive defense systems. 
Let's watch the macrophage try to destroy the tuberculosis bacterium. Now we'll enhance the macrophage's killing ability by bringing the T cell to it. Natural killer NK cells are unusual in that they are a type of lymphocyte and yet they are involved in innate immunity. They make up 10 to 15 percent of the lymphocytes circulating in the blood. Let's compare these unusual lymphocytes to B and T cells. Like T cells, NK cells kill the body's own cells under two circumstances. If those cells have been invaded by intracellular pathogens, or if they have become cancerous. NK cells also attack transplanted tissues, playing a role in the rejection of transplanted organs. NK cells are larger than B and T cells and contain granules in their cytoplasm. Thus, NK cells are sometimes called large granular lymphocytes. While B and T cells express specific receptors for antigen, no such receptors are found on NK cells. Yet NK cells can recognize a variety of cells as abnormal, bind to them, and kill them. Now, let's learn how the NK cells recognize abnormal cells. Abnormal cells, such as cancerous cells or those infected by viruses, often reduce the expression of certain membrane proteins. The suppressed proteins are those that tell the immune system that a given cell is self, in other words, that it belongs to the body. NK cells look for the absence of these self proteins. It's as if NK cells were saying, if I can't identify you as one of us, then you are a traitor and I will kill you. Let's watch the NK guard identify the traitor. <laughs> Traitor! NK cells and T cells are the two kinds of cells that continually scan our cells for abnormalities, a process called immune surveillance. They act in complementary fashion. T cells look for the presence of abnormal antigens on the cell surface, while NK cells look for the absence of normally occurring cell proteins. How do NK cells kill abnormal cells? the same way that cells called cytotoxic T cells kill, a process we will explore in detail later. For now, let's just say that killing involves direct contact and induces the target cell to undergo apoptosis, which is programmed cell death or cellular suicide. NK cells are important in the early response to pathogens, acting to contain pathogens before the adaptive immune responses can take over. They continue to play a role after B and T cells are activated. Like macrophages, NK cells become more effective killers following activation by cytokines from certain T cells. Likewise, coating cells with antibody makes them better targets for killing by NK cells just as coating pathogens with antibodies make them better targets for phagocytes. These processes show of how innate and adaptive host defenses work together to protect us from infections. The first set of antimicrobial proteins we will consider are the interferons. Interferons are members of a larger group of chemicals called cytokines that modulate the immune system. Interferons interfere with viral replication, modulate inflammation, and activate immune cells. The three types of interferon, alpha, beta, and gamma, are distinct proteins, but have common as well as unique functions. Gamma interferons act in a variety of ways to signal other immune and non-immune cells, and we will consider later. Here we will learn about the antiviral properties of alpha and beta interferons. Let's begin by examining how viruses replicate within cells. Recall that viruses must enter cells to replicate. This is because a virus is little more than a protein-covered packet of nucleic acids, the genetic instructions for how to create a new virus. 
When a virus penetrates the target cell's membrane, it releases its nucleic acid and takes over the host cell's machinery to make more copies of that virus. The presence of a virus replicating inside it causes the cell to produce and secrete interferons. Interferons bind to plasma membrane receptors on nearby cells. They act as warning signals for as yet uninfected cells, telling them that there is a virus on the loose. In response, the uninfected cells produce proteins that inhibit viral replication. These proteins act by degrading viral RNA and by preventing the synthesis of viral proteins. Let's see how this process works. Now let's see if a virus can reproduce itself when it tries to enter a cell that has been alerted by interferon. Chewing up viral RNA and blocking protein synthesis are nonspecific in that they work against any virus. In the short term, these mechanisms protect uninfected cells not only against the virus that invaded its neighbor, but also against any other viruses that may be in the area. The next set of antimicrobial proteins we will consider is the complement system. Complement gets its name from the fact that it complements or enhances other components of both innate and adaptive defenses. Like the blood clotting cascade, complement is actually a complex cascade of interdependent plasma proteins. As each protein is activated, it becomes an enzyme that activates the next protein until the final product is formed. When activated, these proteins can mark cells for phagocytosis, promote inflammation, and even kill some bacteria, all by themselves. Now, let's watch what happens when complement proteins enter this bacterium and see how it is lysed by the end products of the complement cascade. Because there are such a wide variety of pathogens, we need a corresponding breadth and depth of defense. Like a medieval castle, the immune system has three main lines of defense against the invading hordes that besiege it. Let's examine each one in the order a pathogen would encounter them. The first line of defense consists of the surface barriers to entry, also called innate external defenses. Like the walls of the castle, the skin and mucous membranes form this barrier. Like the moat surrounding the walls, many of the body's barriers are coated in secretions, such as mucus and tears. The second line of defense in a castle consists of the guards, who check everyone they encounter to determine if they are friend or foe. The body has similar defenses. Cells and chemicals in body fluids that are always on the ready to attack and destroy anything they identify as foe. These defenses are called the innate internal defenses. The guards can also call on the third line of defense, the army. The body's armies are called the adaptive defenses. The adaptive defenses consist of two kinds of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. It takes time to mobilize them and train them to fight an identified enemy. When surface barriers and secretions are penetrated by an enemy, the innate internal defense mechanisms, acting as guards, step into action. The innate defenses identify enemies by recognizing a limited number of markers unique to pathogens. When they recognize enemies, they attack immediately and often manage to eliminate the threat. When the innate defenses are overwhelmed, they secrete chemical messengers to mobilize the armies of adaptive defenses. Unlike the medieval soldiers, B cells and T cells don't have eyes. Instead, they play a game of blind man's bluff, touching everything they encounter and searching for a special shape that they recognize and to which they can bind. 
The special shape that a particular lymphocyte recognizes is called an antigenic determinant and is formed by the three-dimensional structure of a large molecule called an antigen. Antigens are usually proteins, but can also be large carbohydrates or nucleic acids. The surface of any given pathogen is studded with many different antigens, each usually having many different antigenic determinants. In our soldier analogy, the enemy is the pathogen, the antigen is the enemy's face, and the antigenic determinant is just part of his face, in this case the nose. Let's look at one antigen's antigenic determinants. For simplicity, most people refer to antigenic determinants simply as antigens. We will do the same. Both B and T cells bind antigens. Protein molecules called antibodies also bind antigens. These antibodies, which play an important role in destroying pathogens, are secreted by the clonal descendants of B cells called plasma cells. Antibodies float freely in extracellular fluids such as the blood. These fluids, once called humors, like the vitreous and aqueous humors of the eye, can be transferred from one person to another, carrying the antibodies with them and thereby transferring immunity from one person to another. The branch of adaptive immunity that can be transferred via body fluids is called humoral immunity and involves B cells and the antibodies they ultimately produce. Humoral immunity is directed against extracellular pathogens. In contrast, the other branch of adaptive immunity cannot be transferred via transferring body fluids. It is called cellular immunity because it involves cells, the T cells, which directly attack other cells. The cells attacked by these T cells are cells of our own body. Think about which of these circumstances cause your T cells to attack cells of your own body. Let's see if you're right. While you might not have thought of this at first, cells from another individual are like the cells of one's own body, but have differences in their surface proteins because of individual variation. Let's summarize what you have learned. The type of cells involved in humoral immunity are B cells. T cells are involved with cellular immunity. Humoral immunity involves antibodies, while cellular immunity does not. And finally, humoral immunity deals with extracellular pathogens, while the pathogens targeted by cellular immunity are intracellular. While it is important for you to keep these key points in mind, note that there are many interactions between cellular and humoral immunity. In fact, humoral immunity cannot function without cellular immunity in the form of helper T cells.